So <clears throat> maybe not the most exciting topic tonight, but I think it's one that's necessary to understand the uh, church structure and uh, to understand how orthodoxy appears here in the United States and how it is expressed in the life of the parish, the metropolis, the archdiocese, etc. cetera. Um, so this is sort of a, a, a complicated diagram and I'm just gonna try to point things out without a pointer. Here we have in the middle at the top, the ancient seas of Christianity. You have uh, minus Rome, you have Jerusalem, Antioch, and Alexandria. And then later in the fourth century, Constantinople, because the capital was moved from Rome to what was Byzantium, and then after Constantine rebuilt that city, named after him. So all of these are the ancient seas, now known as patriarchates. Then you have autonomous churches under the patriarchate of Constantinople. And these, of course, were given autonomy over time. The Finnish Orthodox Church in Finland, the Estonian Apostolic Orthodox Church in Estonia, which used to be under the Soviet Union, the Archdiocese of the Russian Orthodox Church in Western Europe. Then you have the Church of Mount Sinai, where the Monastery of St. Catherine is, under Jerusalem, but given autonomy. You have under Serbia, the Orthodox Ohrid Arch Archbishopric. Under Romania, the Romanian Orthodox Archdiocese in the Americas and the Metropolitan Church of Bessarabia. So you're going to notice several places where you have these different churches existing in the United States, but sometimes under different patriarchates. If we go this direction, under the Church of Alexandria, we have the Antiochian Orthodox Christian Archdiocese of America. I shouldn't say Alexandria, I should say the, the, the Church of Antioch, sorry. Under Russia, let me first go over these junior patriarchates. You have the Russian Orthodox Church, the Serbian Orthodox Church, the Romanian Orthodox Church, the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, and the Georgian Orthodox and Apostolic Church. These have been given the status of patriarchates, but they're not from the ancient seas that started Christianity. And from the Russian Orthodox Church, you have the Belarusian Orthodox Church, the Latvian Orthodox Church, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, the Moldavian, Moldavian Orthodox Church, the Japanese Orthodox Church, and the Chinese Orthodox Church. And then you have the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, which initially was a schism between Moscow and itself. And then in latter years recently has has reconciled. This Russian Orthodox Church, this Antiochian Orthodox Church, this Romanian Orthodox Archdiocese under Romania, you all find in the United States. Then you have autocephalous churches, and these are archbishoprics. The Church of Cyprus, the Church of Greece, the Albanian Orthodox Church, the Polish Orthodox Church, the Czech and Slovak Orthodox Church. This one is kind of in quotes, the Orthodox Church in America. The reason it's in quotes is because the Russian Orthodox Patriarchate granted autocephaly to the 
Metropolia of Moscow, which then became known as the Orthodox Church in America. But the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople challenged the authority of Moscow to grant autocephaly to a church in the diaspora. Okay? It doesn't mean that we're not in communion with the OCA. It's just something that the higher-ups are still working through. That's why they sort of say partially recognized. So let me take a step back and say that within the tradition, the canonical and ecclesiastical tradition of the church, the situation in North America, in some places in South America, is not quote unquote canonically correct. Okay? But that's because perhaps not enough time has passed for it to be worked out. If you think about the United States, for example, and it's true of Canada, it's true in South America, Central America, many people from all over these areas came to the United States and North, all of North America, Central America and South America from these ancient Orthodox countries and regions. And of course, they brought their faith with them. And oftentimes, it was the laity that came and arrived here first. Not so true in terms of, well, that's even true of Russia. And then priests came to serve them. And then bishops came to serve those churches. And so because it was a land of opportunity, it also became, in a sense, a mission field. And so the churches in the old countries didn't have even the ability or the opportunity to organize themselves and communicate and work it out. One of the reasons why the ecumenical patriarchate of Constantinople, in, 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 for example, wasn't totally with Moscow giving the Metropolia Moscow autocephaly is because one of the ecumenical councils gave the Patriarchate of Constantinople jurisdiction over the diaspora. Okay? And they considered, Constantinople considered America the diaspora would consider places like Australia, the diaspora, or Western Europe, the diaspora. Okay? Now, God willing, all of this will work out in time. Okay? Maybe not our lifetime. But orthodoxy continues to, to function. And for the most part, all of these patriarchates and autonomous churches and autocephalous churches and dependencies are in communion with each other. Okay? There are points in time where sometimes that gets interrupted for things that are going on in the world, but not for theological reasons. Okay, so let me just stop there for a second and say, are there any questions that leap out to you? Diaspora means territory outside of the existing Orthodox Church. New territory that hasn't been missionized. On that um, point, um, it's interesting, you might like to know, with due respect to the Roman Catholic Church, in the 15th century, they developed a uh, doctrine the doctrine of discoveries. They had a papal 
claimed that wherever they found a new land, it was theirs. It was their own rules. Hence why we had so much confrontations here in North America, particularly in American Canada, with the uh, imposition that the Roman Catholic Church put on the Native Americans. They upheld their doctrine of discovery. We discovered America, but we're in charge here. A little bit uh, problematic to explain. The doctrine of discovery from the Roman Catholic Church. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Kyler. Of Cyprus, Cyprus would also fall in line with that. So the question is, why, uh, why would the Church of Greece and the Church of Cyprus now be autocephalous? They used to be under the Patriarchate of Constantinople, but they were granted autocephaly by Constantinople, and that's why. Okay, and and one of the one of the criteria that you might think about is, has the Church matured and is it able to self-govern itself in a way that brings glory to God and brings and bears spiritual fruit and therefore they request it or they declare it and it gets ratified sometimes it happens either way yeah good question yes what's the difference between autonomy and autocephaly great question functionally no difference. Okay. Autocephaly, literally in, in, a, in a literal translation of the Greek, would be self-headed. And autonomous would be, in a sense, um, able to rule on its own, apart from being under as a satellite uh, jurisdiction of a patriarchate. But functionally, no different. You're talking about 2,100 years of history, and uh, I, you know, I'm not the, yeah, I, I, and 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 I think that uh, you know there probably is a canon law difference, but since there's not a functional difference, I can't remember to tell you the truth. Yeah, you could go look it up though, and you'd probably get some really, really, really good, detailed explanation, Eva. Mm, that may be. Yeah, I couldn't tell you. Okay, let's keep going. So this is another diagram sort of zooming in. Here we have the ecumenical patriarchate in Constantinople, now Istanbul. Under it is the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. Under that would be the Holy Eparchial Synod, meaning that all of the Archbishop and all of the Metropolitans of the different metropolises would make up this Holy Eparchial Synod. And then Think of, think of some of this like you do in parish administration and polity. You have the clergy. You have, in a parish, the general assembly. In the archdiocese, you have, every other year, a clergy lady assembly called a congress. And rep all of the clergy from every one of the parishes and, and lay, lay delegates are sent every other year to this Congress. And this Congress has the authority to make decisions that, it, that administer the archdiocese, just like a general assembly has authority to make decisions on behalf of the parish. OK? 
Okay. At the metropolis level, there is also clergy laities. Okay. So at the archdiocesan level, the metropolis level, and then at the parish level, we call them general assemblies. Now, just like there is at the parish level a parish council, at the archdiocesan level, there's an archdiocesan council. Again, with representatives from every single metropolis and representatives from the archdiocese and some ad hoc members who are appointed by the archbishop who heads the eparchial synod. And they meet a few times a year okay, to carry out the administration of the archdiocese in a national level. And within this, there are all kinds of committees. These yellow boxes represent committees that are focused on different areas of interior ministry, external relations, and things that need to happen within the archdiocese, just like we in parish and at the metropolis level have committees and ministries to carry out the mission of the church. These sort of green boxes are archdiocesan ministries that are not under the metropolis and therefore not under parishes. One of them would be St. Basil's Academy. And if you were here uh, two weeks ago, we had on the last Sunday of December, December 31st, the selling of loaves of bread called St. Basil's Bread or Vasilopita. And we had a free will offering tray in the narthex, a free will offering tray here in the fellowship hall during coffee hour, so that the Philoptahos of our parish could raise money for this national ministry, St. Basil Academy. Okay, it is an orphanage and it is a home for underprivileged, challenged children financially. Not challenged in terms of other disabilities, but financially. St. Photio Shrine is another national ministry. Historically, this was one of the first communities ever to land from Greece in the United States, and it just became a national ministry. Our holy water bottles, for example, come from this St. Photio Shrine. Hellenic College, a liberal arts school, undergraduate, and Holy Cross School of Theology, our seminary, where all of the priests and future bishops get educated, is a national ministry. St. Michael's Home for the Aged is a national ministry. It is because historically it was directly under the archdiocese and has stayed that way. People might say today, well, what's the logic behind having a, a, a home for the aged under the archdiocese? It happens to be in New York, and there's this historical uh, precedent set. And so no one's making any efforts to uh, change that and put it under, let's say, the direct archdiocesan district, would, which, which would be a metropolis. Okay, I'm just anticipating why that, this, a question that might be asked about that. And then the Archdiocesan Cathedral of Holy Trinity. Again, a historical precedent has made it a national ministry rather than under the local region. Okay, Does it always have to be that way? Absolutely not. Would it be probably better, more practical to change it? Probably, in my humble opinion. But there's a historical precedence and change happens very slowly and no one's really pushing for it. All right, now these sort of tan, beige, are also national ministries. The Retired Clergy Association, Leadership 100, which is an endowment program. And you pledge $100,000 
over 10 years, paying it off over that 10 year period. And they do a tremendous amount of work on behalf of the archdiocese in lots and lots of different ways. For example, I'll just give you one example, but this is one of many. I'll give you two because they're, they're different, just to give you an idea. You can write a grant proposal to study parish efforts in the archdiocese that are proven and really effective at not only meeting the spiritual salvific needs of its own, para, its own people, but really doing a good job of growing orthodoxy in their area, attracting and retaining and bringing in and forming new disciples. And you can study all the best practices and look at what future trends are happening and come up with a proposed plan, strategic plan, on how to go forward, let's say in the next 10 years, on a particular track, and how to educate parishes that are not doing well, and those are just maintaining, to get them to become healthier and do a better job at accomplishing their mission. That is already something that Leadership 100 is funding. Another one would be to give all of the seminarians at Holy Cross a grant to help them to afford their education so that they can come, go and serve the church as priests, as lay leaders who have a theological education. That's another way that Leadership 100 helps. So that just gives you an example. The Orthodox chaplains, the Archdiocesan Presbyters Council, which is a council of priests who represent all the priests and work with the Archdiocese and the Synod to help the clergy. Okay? They're kind of a council that creates really healthy dialogue between the Archdiocese, the parishes, the people, and the clergy. The Hellenic Cultural Center, which focuses on uh, Hellenism and uh, helping people here in America who are really care about this to, to better understand it and understand its uh, historical virtues and all of the things that make uh, Hellenism something that helps people. Faith is another endowment within the uh, archdiocese that has a slightly different focus than Leadership 100. The archons of the ecumenical patriarchate are people in this archdiocese, lay people, who are in a sense elected or recommended to be archons, and then they as a group try to take care of looking out for issues that are threatening the patriarchate, which finds itself in Turkey, which is a Muslim country. And there's tremendous amounts of pressure put on the patriarchate that make it hard for them to accomplish their mission. The, pa the archons focus on some of those challenges and from the United States try to help them politically, financially, in, in, in any way that they can. The Ladies Philopto Society is a national ministry that exists at the archdiocesan level, the metropolis level, and the parish level. And the word philoptochos means friends of the poor. And so it is a philanthropic organization made of, up of the women of the church. And they deal with local charitable action, regional charitable action, national and international. 
while they're all members of their local parish, the actual ministry itself is self-governing at the local, regional, and national level. The National Forum for Orthodox Church Musicians helps support choirs and chanters and youth choirs, literally at the parish level. So they're just sort of a forum for best practices and resources and training, et cetera. There's the National Sisterhood of Presbyteras, which is the sister organization for the Presbyters Council. Okay, this is to try to take care of uh, meeting the needs and the challenges and the support of priests' wives and the aconisas, the deacons' wives. Okay, and those are all organizations that are under the archdiocese that are not funded like these are by the archdiocesan budget, but are under the archdiocese, okay? And then these blue ones are ministries that focus sort of on religious relationships in the United States, in the world, regionally, locally. And then all of these purple boxes, not boxes, but triangles, are the different metropolises that represent the geography of the United States. We'll start here on this side. The direct archdiocesan district covers greater New York, upstate New York, Long Island, Connecticut, Washington, D.C., and the Bahamas. Why the Bahamas? Because there's a historical precedent for that. Okay. The metropolis of Atlanta covers Georgia, North Carolina, Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, South Carolina, and some parishes in Louisiana and Tennessee. I would say all the parishes in Louisiana, except for Shreveport and one chapel, which are in the metropolis of Denver. Why? There's a historical precedent. The metropolis of Boston covers the state of Massachusetts, the state of Maine, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Vermont, and some parishes in Connecticut. The metropolis of Chicago covers the states of Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, except Kansas City, and some parishes in Indiana. The metropolis of Denver, Colorado, Idaho, Kansas, Montana, Nebraska, New Mexico, North Dakota, of which we have zero parishes, but if we ever do, it would be ours. Oklahoma, South Dakota, Texas, Utah, Wyoming. Now keep in mind, those are all really big states. One parish in Missouri, Kansas City, and one parish in Louisiana, Shreveport. This metropolis here, considering the lower 48, has by far the largest geographic footprint and the least amount of parishes. The metropolis of Detroit, Detroit covers the states of Michigan, Arkansas, Kentucky, some parishes in Indiana, some parishes in Ohio, some parishes in Upper New York, and some parishes in Tennessee. That's a really weird one. And Tennessee, yeah. <clears throat> Then you have the metropolis of New Jersey, which covers New Jersey, greater Philadelphia, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. Now that's a very small geography, but look, 55 parishes. This is a 
huge geography. And we have 48 parishes. Just to give you an idea, 67% of the parishes in the metropolis of Denver are under 100 families and well over 100 miles from the next Greek Orthodox parish. So small and fairly isolated. Doesn't mean there aren't parishes of other jurisdictions, but Greek Orthodox parishes. Then you have the metropolis of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, except greater Philadelphia, West Virginia, some parishes in Ohio, except Dayton, Toledo, Middleton, uh, Cincinnati, and Springfield. So again, a very small geography, but a large concentration of parishes. And this is historical. Okay. In a lot of these areas, relatively speaking, there has not been a vigorous planting of parishes. These have been around a long time in general. Okay. The exception would be, if I was speaking in general, Atlanta, Denver, and San Francisco. So the last one I haven't covered is San Francisco. Uh, it, ha it covers all of California, all of Arizona, all of Nevada, all of Oregon, all of Washington, all of Hawaii, and all of Alaska. Now, all of Alaska translates to Anchorage, one parish. Okay? the largest state by far, but it only covers one parish in Anchorage. I know that well because I was the vicar of the Northwest when I was in Oregon and Anchorage was my territory. So I would go up there quite often. Hated going in the winter, but loved going in the summer. So each of these metropolises has their own metropolitan with the exception of the direct archdiocesan district, which has as its head the archbishop. Okay? So that's a really high level snapshot of the archdiocese, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America. Question. He did, his whole life. Born, raised, went to seminary, came back, served as an assistant, and then was elevated to the Preuss Domino, stayed there 26 years until he was made an auxiliary bishop and came to Denver to serve, which is rare. Rare to have that kind of longevity only in one place and in the same parish. No, I would never use the word climb. As opposed to in your priestly ministry serving in several locales rather than only one and coming back to your exact same parish, okay? If you look at Father Christodoulos and I, you know, we, we've, been, we've been of several places, okay? All right, now, this is, oh, yes, Caleb. Uh, Do you want me to go back? I was actually going to ask the question. Okay, so here you go. This is in general, broad stroke. Patriarch is a bishop who is enthroned to serve a patriarchate, but still a bishop. An archbishop is a bishop who is enthroned, elected, and enthroned to serve an archdiocese or archbishopric. Okay? The head of the Church of Greece is an archbishop, but it's an autocephalous church. Okay? In general, a metropolitan serves a metropolis, okay? Now, these are the rule. 
there are historical exceptions to this where titles might differ. Okay? All metropolitans are bishops. All archbishops are bishops. All patriarchs are bishops. If they are all going to a council, they all get one vote. Okay? Wherever that council may be held, whoever is the head of that local church would preside, but they all get one vote. You call them by different titles. The titles go with the office. Okay? For example, your grace, your eminence, your eminence, and your all holiness. And in Greek, it's even more complicated, but it's the same thing. Priests are priests are priests. In each historical jurisdiction, they might have different honors and different titles that go with those honors, but a priest is a priest is a priest. In the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese, when you're ordained a pre to the priesthood as a priest, a presbyter, you cannot automatically hear confessions. It is an office that's bestowed upon you. And typically, not, not in every case, but there is a garment of your vestments that denotes your office, which we call ophikion. Okay? The same is true of wearing a cross with your vestments. Okay? The Russians have many, many, many more levels. They have different kinds of crosses. They have different kinds of hats and colors of hats, and they have all kinds of titles that go with that. The one huge difference is when a Russian priest is ordained, they automatically have the office of hearing confessions. That's not true in the Greek Orthodox world, okay? Deacons are deacons are deacons, but you might have a deacon and you might have an archdeacon. If you have been at St. Catherine a while, you will realize that Deacon Paul is now Archdeacon Paul. Okay. But being in the Greek Orthodox world, he just says, okay. In the world, that might be true, but in God's eyes, I'm just a deacon. Okay. Does this make sense to everybody in general? Oh, he's Deacon Dino. Right. Yeah. And Father Dino and Father Theodore. Yeah, and Metropolitan Isaiah, El Pido Foros, New York City, Manhattan, Constantinople slash Istanbul, and he's Bartholomew. Now, here's an interesting thing, and this is true for each level. When there is a concelebration, meaning when you have at one service more than one patriarch uh, serving, let's say it's at a church of the patriarch of Moscow. The patriarch of Moscow would preside. Then it would go by preeminence of patriarchate. When you have archbishops, the same way. If they were equal, then you'd go by when they were elevated to that office. When you have bishops, same thing. Priests, generally the same thing. Here's the difference in the priests, though. Archimandrites outrank any other office of the presbyters. Archimandrites historically were abbots of monasteries. So an abbot of a monastery is under a bishop. He can be under, you know, of, of he can be under a metropolitan archbishop or patriarch. 
okay? But he is given elevated authority over his monastery, okay? And that's why they were historically called Archimandritis, Archimandrite. Today, that's not necessarily the case. A ranking bishop can elevate a celibate presbyter to the order of Archimandrite. And once that's done, then that Archimandrite, has, uh, he has seniority or, or, or presvia over the married priests. Okay, an, a celibate priest who's not an Archimandrite, it goes by a different way. So for outside of the Archimandrites, like Father Christodoulos, the priests line up and serve in the order of the date of their ordination in the Greek archdiocese. In the Russians, they even include offices. So if you have an elevated office, it doesn't matter exactly when you are ordained, it's when you receive the office. And that gives you precedence in terms of order of where you stand and where you, where you go in processions. The reason for all this, it seems sort of, you know, why? And the reason is, you know how uh, there's a lead and a follower in dancing? so you don't step on each other's toes and crash into each other and look like a mess. That's, that's how it is when we all get together and we serve. Automatically, we know who has, what order we go in. So when you see four or five priests in a liturgy, they all know what's going to happen. In a wedding, in a baptism, in a funeral. Okay, so it keeps, it keeps order and people don't step on each other's toes and run into each other, okay? And, and in, the, in the church, we're always trying to, like the Holy Trinity, outdo one another in showing brotherly love. We're constantly trying to submit to the other. And this is a way, practically, to submit to each other. Okay, so like tonight at Vespers, I was presiding, Father Dino was concelebrating. He follows my lead. I determine, and so does the service, who does what. And it just happens really harmoniously because we're mutually submitting to each other. As the Father submits to the Son, the Son to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to the Father in this inner penetration, uh, this dancing in a circle of perichoresis that we talk about when we talk about life in the Holy Trinity. Questions? Yes? Father who? I don't know him. Oh, I know Father Chrysostom Gilbert. Yes, he is an Archimandriti. Keep in mind that most of the Archimandrites in our Greek Orthodox Archdiocese are not abbots of monasteries. Okay, there are some, though, for sure. And all the abbots of the monasteries under the archdiocese are our commandrites. Quick question, I think it's a quick question. You mentioned an office of hearing confession. There's a, a separate office. In the Greek Orthodox order of things. Is, is that, well, my question is, did you, like we, we were 20 years at an Antiochian parish before coming here, and I don't think that the Antiochians have a separation of, that there's a separate that a priest who doesn't hear confession, or at least is not assumed to hear confession, is that office non-existent in the Antiochian Archdiocese, or is it granted uniformly at ordination? And the Greeks just separate that out. It's a quick, quick answer. 
Of course, the office exists. It's a, it's a matter of whether it goes with the ordination or if it's separately bestowed at a later time by the hierarch. That makes sense. But it still exists. Okay. Yeah. I, I've never heard of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, Caleb. So you were saying that all patriarchs, archbishop, metropolitan, are all bishops. Are all of those priests as well? They were first priests. So that's a great question, Caleb. Thank you. So you have the laity in the hierarchy down here, and reader and subdeacon. These are minor orders. Okay, they're in Greek they're called hierothesia. But ordination, which starts at the diaconate, is called hierotonia. So your minor orders and then your major orders, which have three levels, deacon, priest, bishop. So if someone goes from being a lay person, they first need to be made a reader, then a subdeacon. That can happen together. To be made a deacon, it has to be done by a bishop, and it has to be done at a divine liturgy. Once a reader and subdeacon is made a deacon, that's it for that day. If the bishop wants to elevate the deacon to presbyter, it has to be another day at another divine liturgy. Okay. In the case of St. Photios the Great, one day he was made a deacon, the next day a presbyter, and the next day a bishop, elected to the throne and became the Patriarch of Constantinople. Okay? But you must be lay, minor order, deacon, then elevated within the priesthood to presbyter, and then elevated again within the priesthood to bishop. The one difference in the elevation from a presbyter to a bishop, and this is a ecclesiastical check and balance is that it takes two bishops to ordain a presbyter to a bishop so that you as a bishop cannot stack the deck within your own diocese you need to find another bishop from another diocese who concurs with you that the candidate meets the canonical worthiness and also the need to protect the church. Obviously, there were mishaps in that way in the past, and so that's why the church responded by saying this has to take place from now on. So for a priest to become a bishop, they have to be separate? Correct. Or widowed. Well, keep in mind that the canonical norm over history was that each, each area only had one bishop. And so that would be the norm. Okay, yes? I think so. <laughs> Oh, that's a great, that, well, first of all, you're, you're asking a great question anyway, because in our case, we're living through kind of an interesting, kind of exceptional time where we have an aged metropolitan over the metropolis of Denver who has been serving this metropolis for three, three plus decades, who has not retired so on the books, quote unquote, for lack of a better word, he is the reigning, serving metropolitan. But because he's 93, because he had a serious injury and needed surgery, and that injury has really set him back in many ways because of his age, he is now convalescing at a local monastery under his administration holy archangels between Texas 
and I mean between uh, San Antonio and Asta, Austin and Candelia, Texas. Short of a miracle, he will not be able to really truly uh, continue to administer the metropolis. Even before that all happened, he knew with this, keep in mind, I'll just flash back for a second, with this large of a metropolis, and maybe even moving forward, because that's a picture of it, the yellow is Missouri and Louisiana, and we have Kansas City, Missouri, and Shreveport, Louisiana, about right there. Knowing how big that is, He brought in, he requested from the archdiocese, the synod, who had to request from the patriarchate, and there is a process, to get a, a bishop assigned to help him in this metropolis. So go back to this slide. A presbyter was elevated to bishop, Bishop Constantine. He was then assigned to serve the metropolis of Denver as an assistant or auxiliary bishop, submitting canonically to the direction of Metropolitan Isaiah. It's similar to a parish having a prois dominos and an assistant priest, Father Theodore, Father Dino. Father Dino is 100% a priest. Father Theodore is 100% a priest. But in the administration of St. Catherine, there is a hierarchy. Prois Dominos, the priest, the presiding priest. Father Dino, the assistant priest. In this metropolis of Denver, there is a metropolitan and an assistant bishop. Now, until Metropolitan Isaiah officially retires, Bishop Constantine has been made the chancellor of this metropolis who is administering the metropolis in his place with his blessing and the blessing of the archdiocese, okay, in a way that continues to help the metropolis function but not like he could and would if and when Metropolitan Isaiah retires or resigns, he would retire, um, or let's say he was to pass away. It doesn't mean, though, that Constantine automatically becomes the Metropolitan. That's a whole nother process that always has to take place. And that is that the Archdiocesan Synod has to vote among a list of approved candidates to the episcopacy, and the top three names, vote getting wise, are then submitted to the Synod of the Patriarchate of Constantinople. And then they pick from the three names and send back that name to the archdiocese. And then that is the one who is then approved to be made Metropolitan of Denver. Make sense? Now that didn't answer your question. Our relationship with Bishop Constantine as chancellor and as ad administrative bishop is uh, very much like it would be if it were Metropolitan Isaiah in good health and functioning. So he, he being young versus Metropolitan Isaiah, who was pretty old for a long time and hard to, hard to cover all of that area. In, in Bishop Constantine's first year of serving as assistant bishop of the metropolis of Denver, he has visited every single parish in that 14 state region. If you were to ask him, well, what's your plans in 2024? Do it again. Do it again. Okay? So each of the presbyters, the deacons, 
the lay leadership, the general membership of the parishes gets to see Bishop Constantine at least once a year. Those of us who are in Denver see him often. But being a young bishop and being the personality that he has, he is a very efficient user of his cell phone. So if you text him, he answers you right away if he's not on an airplane. If you call him and you can't get a hold of him, he'll call you back. He's a, he loves email, so he'll email you. He's directly and constantly communicating uh, to whoever he needs to to get accomplished what he feels needs to be done. And he's very available to people who reach out to him for direction and permission. And so do we think Constantine as the shepherd to the sheep? Right now he is, until further directed. Not just the priests, the parish councils, the deacons, and by extension, the parishes. Mm -hmm. Caleb. What's a synod? Synod. Every patriarchate, autonomous church, autocephalous church, archbishopric, archdiocese, they all have all of their bishops sit and meet at least two, three times a year or as needed as a council to administer the area that they are over, that they have authority over. A synod is a gathering. A parish council acts as a synod. A clergy brotherhood, in a sense, acts as a synod, even though uh, a clergy brotherhood doesn't have exactly the same authority as a synod. A synod has a, a authority as bishops to shepherd the greater church. So in our case as an archdiocese, all of the metropolitans and the archbishop gather as a synod. They have another bishop who acts as their secretary, and there might be a couple other assistant bishops who help out in administrative and supportive roles. But they all gather about three times a year. They could call special synodal gatherings if they needed to, to talk about the issues that are under their authority. Okay, just like at the Patriarchate and, and everywhere else all over the world in all these jurisdictions. Okay? It's after the model of the Council of the Apostles that met in Jerusalem. The Synod, in a way, kind of functions in an in a everyday way like a council would to, to uh, face issues that are contemporary, that are facing the church, and to apply the apostolic faith to those issues so that the people have guidance, they have clarity, okay? Other questions? So this is the metropolis of Denver. Neil? One question on, on the uh, previous chapter, like the responsibilities that a deacon could do versus a priest as far as like sacraments, how does that work? Okay, great question. Deacons on their own <clears throat> cannot serve the sacraments. They assist. Having said that, they can distribute Holy Communion, unction, okay? But they cannot, in a sense, consecrate the oil. They cannot consecrate the bread and wine. They cannot marry on their own. They cannot chrismate on their own. They cannot, they cannot chrismate, but they can't baptize. Okay? But they assist. And deacon, by its very definition, means servant. Remember the initial reason for the seven deacons being ordained because the apostles were waiting on tables and they weren't preaching and teaching and you know, making disciples of all nations. And so these deacons were ordained and they had 
you know, all that criteria that's covered in Acts to serve the everyday needs of the church. So they can go into hospitals, into uh, assisted living centers, into homes, and they can bring the sacraments to the people. They can say prayers over them. They don't bless, even though they give blessings. Okay, we don't venerate their right hand. We only venerate the right hand of a presbyter and a bishop because they're the celebrants in Christ's high priesthood of the sacraments. We're really venerating the priesthood of Christ. And even though deacons are ordained into the priesthood of Christ, not to that level where they can be celebrants of the holy mysteries. So great question. So here we have a diagram kind of of where the local bishop has a relationship with the local parish. You have the local bishop, in our case, Isaiah. Right now we also have Constantine. Parish priest, assistant priest in the case of St. Catherine. Now keep in mind that this, this part here isn't really part of the hierarchy in a sense. The parish staff are serving the parish, right? The highest church-wide authority is the parish general assembly. The everyday authority of doing everyday ministry and administering the parish is the parish council. The parish council brings motions to the general to a parish assembly. You all from the floor can bring motions to a parish assembly. This has authority to bind the church as long as it is canonically and theologically correct. If a parish assembly or a parish council or even the clergy were to bring an issue to the parish that was neither theologically or canonically correct, it's not binding. There are so many checks and balances to keep the parish on the right track, to keep it apostolic. And that's empowering and, and very important to know. So under this is the parish ministries, and under this is all of the body of Christ who make up these ministries, who get elected to the parish council, who attend the general assembly. And the parish staff doesn't have to be members, but the clergy do. Now, keep in mind the relationship of the local bishop, these clergy and the deacon, all the clergy, we are assigned to this parish by him. We can be removed from this parish by him. The clergy are not employees of the parish. They're not employees of the parish council or of the general assembly or of the staff. They are employees of the greater church, if you want to use the word employee. They're servants of the church. They're stewards of the priesthood of Christ. Okay, should we lay down our life for the church? Absolutely. Okay, but we serve at the direction of the bishop. Uh, it's not, it's not totally unique. I mean, there have been councils. There have been congresses and assemblies where not everything that was decided ended up being ratified by the church. But keep in mind, it takes the test of time and it takes the test of the whole church. That's one of the beauties of orthodoxy is there, there isn't one supreme leader who sort of has this unique and, and, and soul pipeline to God. 
and speaks for the church or the people. Any one of... Any one of these hierarchs in a point in time, or even a group of them, could make a decision or make a declaration or say that they stand for this, and it does not represent the whole. It has to pass the test of time. It's just, it, it could end up being just the mistake of that individual. They misspoke, they didn't understand, or it could be that the church rejects that and, and maybe that person needs to undergo tutor, tutoring or correction or education, or maybe they end up being a heretic over time. Who knows? We don't be, we're not hasty to judge, just like we're not hasty to take Kansas City and Shreveport away from those states. We're not hasty. Sometimes we wish we were. Hey, do this quickly, but we're not hasty. We're prayerful. We're reflective. We, we do investigation, due diligence. And we trust in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> well, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, one, of my, one of my favorite examples of this. And I have my second daughter's named after him. St. Athanasios the Great, 4th century. He was a deacon under St. Alexander of Alexandria at the First Ecumenical Council. He then succeeded him after he reposed as the Archbishop or Patriarch of Alexandria. During the time of the prolonged controversy of Arianism, Five times in his service to the Church of Alexandria, he was exiled. There was a time in the East when almost everybody declared themselves in favor of Arius' teaching. But he remained steadfast. Can you imagine today... How many people start their own denominations? How many people lose faith? They lose hope. They can't keep it to themselves and suffer humbly. They talk about it with everybody because they want everybody to share in their misery and to, you know, to, 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 in it somehow let that steam off in unhealthy and div divisive ways. He didn't do that. He trusted in the Holy Spirit. He was patient in his suffering, long suffering. He knew that God would never go back on his promise to abandon the church. And he, he, he was right. In the end, the church stayed orthodox and did not follow Arianism. And everything that he stood for, everything that he wrote, everything that he taught, the witness of his life passed the test of time. That is a church hero. And that's what we need to emulate today. Patience. So, you guys have seen this. It's in the ministry book, or you will see it. All those files over there are the ministry booklet. This is sort of a snapshot of the organizational chart or ministry chart of St. Catherine, and it just so, kind of shows you that each of these ministries has a leader. Each of the ministries has a team. Each leader, each team member is a part of the body of Christ, is submitting to a hierarchy above them, okay? Always remember that to be a good leader, you must be a good follower. If you read the Gospels and you look and examine the sayings of Jesus related to his Father, in some ways you'd say, oh yeah, they're one. In other ways you'd say, man, if they're one, why does Jesus keep saying that he's totally submitting to the Father? Because he was both a good leader, a perfect leader, not a good leader, and the perfect follower. 
that while he is God, he is constantly submitting to the other two persons of the Trinity because there's one operation, one will, one glory, one truth, etc. And that's how husbands and wives should live, and that's how leaders in the church should live. On that point, may I be excused? You may. I have to go. Thank you, Father. You bet. Ag again, another, another uh, this is just the org chart of the youth and young adults. God bless you. Beautiful class. And give you strength. Now, I have talked a little bit about holy tradition, and I'm not going to go into a full-length thing of it. When we talked about scripture and tradition, we talked about this. But this is a picture of St. Catherine Monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai. Within the walls of this monastery is the burning bush. Okay? Still alive. The chapel around that burning bush, you have to take your shoes off to enter it. Still. Okay? The, the monks of St. Anthony's Monastery in Arizona were given permission to take a sprig from the burning bush and plant it at their monastery to see if it would take root, and it did. So we have a, we have a burning bush in the United States. <laughs> but keep in mind that the history of this monastery built by um, people centuries and centuries ago rebuilt having a profound impact on the Bedouins who are Muslim that live so the word tradition means to pass down to pass along literally this Greek word parados means from generation to generation to generation to pass down what? what Christ handed down to the apostles and what is safeguarded by the Holy Spirit. There are two kinds of tradition in the Bible, the traditions of men, and we have some passages here that talk about that. I'll just read one, but they're all similar. You abandon the commandments of God and you hold the tradition of men, rejecting the word of God by your tradition. Word of God doesn't, isn't limited to the scripture here. It's limited to everything that God has passed down. The tradition of God, holy tradition. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. This would be called apostolic tradition. Okay? Because who taught them to those people? Paul. Okay. There's a, there's a differentiation between the tradition of men and therefore the tradition of God, which is apostolic. And I won't read the other ones because we allowed some question and answer. So this might be sort of a brief definition. It's the deposit of faith given by Christ to the apostles and passed on in the church from one generation to the next without addition, alteration, or subtraction. I'm accountable to that, and you're accountable to that if you become Orthodox. So it's preservation of the doctrine of the Lord, uncorrupted, firmly adhering to the faith Jesus delivered to his disciples, keeping it free from blemish and diminution as a royal treasure and a monument of great price. Again, neither adding or subtracting from it. So what does it include? It includes the scriptures, the creed, the decrees of the councils, the holy canons, the divine worship services, the architecture, the iconography, the hymnology, the vestments, lives of the saints, the writings of the fathers. In Acts 2.42, it says, they were regularly, regular in attending the apostles' teaching 
and the communion and the breaking of the bread and the prayers. So that's like a really early synopsis of what, what they were considering holy tradition. We don't consider in the Orthodox Church Scripture and tradition. Okay? It's holy tradition, and then Scripture is part of that. It exists within holy tradition. It's, it's the holy tradition that helped put the Scriptures together. And going back to St. Athanasius the Great, he was one of the first bishops to include in his archdiocese the 27 books of the New Testament. And keep in mind, he was middle of the 4th century. Mm -hmm. Which was one of those controversial books early on. <laughs> but we do consider Holy Scripture to be the most authoritative written component of Holy Tradition. These are some visual examples of things that we might say are, are guided by holy tradition. Some other examples surrounding the life of the uh, Theotokos, her Dormition. We know that these are in Scripture, but they're within the mindset of the church because they're historical realities. The first seven ecumenical councils and even the local councils today, again, were all councils that originally had the intent of being ecumenical, deemed ecumenical, and a part of holy tradition? No. Okay? Even if they had tons of bishops at them, if the decision of the council isn't apostolic, it gets rejected. Think about the weightiness of Acts 15, 28. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, dot, dot, dot. Okay? The intent of a council is to submit to the Holy Spirit and not say anything new but apply what has been held everywhere by all and at all times to something new that is threatening the church. Again, the lives of the saints. Now keep in mind that the writings of the lives of the saints are in a genre, just like the apocalypse of St. John, the revelation, is in a genre. Okay? It's not the same as a gospel. It's apocalyptic literature, okay, which we have also in some of the pro pro prophets of the Old Testament. So you have to read it according to its own genre. It's not a chronological blueprint. Revelation isn't. And if you read it that way, you're going to get really messed up. Okay? And same thing with the genre of the lives of the saints. <clears throat> I put this picture of then Elder Paisios of the Holy Mountain, because at one time he's just an elder, quote-unquote, just an elder. But now he's canonized, he's a saint. Okay, why? Because after time, he is worthy of imitation as he imitated Christ. You can trust that his life is a light to you, that his writings and his teachings you can put them into action. The church wouldn't canonize him if he wasn't trustworthy. Is, God, is the church playing God? No. It's protecting its flock as, a, as, a, as the body of Christ. So keep in mind that holy tradition, it's neither past of course, it's part of the present, but it also synthesizes the future. 
when it comes to the promises of God. So the holy tradition encompasses all of time and beyond. But it is, it intersects with our life right now, in this moment. It's kind of like that concept of remembrance. And it's totally dependent on the Holy Spirit to guide us and to safeguard us. So, the short answer of uh, knowing that holy tradition is of God is that God has preserved it in the church through the Holy Spirit because he promised to do so. He promised that the gates of hell would not prevail over the church, that there would be a faithful remnant when God comes back in his second coming. It is a heresy to think that God, even for a time, would abandon the church, which has been proclaimed. And then all of a sudden, it comes back in all its glory. That's not the truth, because that contradicts Scripture. That's kind of saying the same thing. Okay, any final thoughts or questions?